This is the Married to Doctors podcast, episode number 16. Not every town is going to be the best place for you, but you can, I think, make it the best place for you right now if you want to, and I think it's worth the effort. Welcome to the Married to Doctors podcast. Because we know that being married to a doctor isn't always as glamorous as it sounds, our podcast helps successful homes be happier. We're here to build community, hear your stories, and explore solutions with the experts. Here's your host, Laura McKeldry. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to, I guess, just say thank you for listening and kind of sharing my vision. It's been a little rough lately. We have a lot of things going on, as you can imagine. My husband's finishing up his fellowship. He's trying to make decisions between good job offers, which is fantastic, but it does bring a certain level of stress. It's scary, but whatever, we're just doing our best to make the best decision we can each step along the way. Those of you that write to me and send me reviews, I just want you to know how much it means to me. And I tell you what, I got a review this week that like made a huge difference to me. Someone rated me on Apple Podcasts saying, I love Laura's brave heart. The world thinks that a doctor's spouse's life is one of privilege and whimsy. But being married to endless calls, student loans, and the responsibility of someone's health is not in line with the Hollywood version of luxury and indulgent vacations. It's more soulful than that. It is a life of supreme service and honor, but that service and honor can come at a price. And I love that Laura is brave enough to address these costs. We are all in this together for our spouses, for the patients, and for medical marriages. Well done, Laura. Well, golly gee, I don't know who you are, Tulip9901, but oh my gosh, thank you. That is the most beautiful review. Now, today's guest is Melody Warnick. She has written a wonderful book discussing how to be successful in a move, how you can engage and really learn to make wherever you live feel like a home. I have a link to her book in the show notes. I think many of you will relate to this. If any of you are getting ready to move for a job or for a match, and we will jump into the interview. Melody, thank you so much for joining me on the Married to Doctors podcast. I'm so happy to be with you, Laura. I am so excited to discuss with you the art of moving. So tell us a little bit about your book. So This Is Where You Belong started as a really personal story. Um, I was one of those kids who lived in the same house my entire growing up years in Southern California, never moved a single time till I went to college. Um, But then at the end of my college career, I got married to a rather restless soul. And for the next about 15 years, we just moved. You know, every few years we moved from Utah where we were going to school to Maryland and then back to Utah and then to Iowa for more school and Texas for a first job and ended up in Virginia for another job when the first job wasn't quite as pleasing as my husband thought it would be. And every time we moved, it felt like this huge upheaval. You know, every community was so different. And every time we landed in a new spot, we'd have to go through this process of finding out who we were in this place and how we fit in and whether we belonged there or not. And sometimes whether or not we did, we would move again very, you know, shortly thereafter. So when we got to Blacksburg, Virginia, um, for my husband to take a job at the university here, I knew right away that I didn't like it. (laughs) I had wanted to like it. I really planned that this was going to change my life in all these positive ways. But um, after we got here, I realized, uh, you know, I've never lived in this part of the South before and, you know, it rains every day. I don't know anyone. I don't know where anything is. Moving is a chaotic process in the best of circumstances. And when you land in a place not entirely by choice, it can feel really lonely and overwhelming. And I started to wonder what has to happen for me to be happy here? You know, my first reaction was, well, I don't like it. We'll just move again. No big deal. You know, get back on realtor.com. But um, 
we have a couple kids who were in school. I was starting to feel really guilty about moving them all the time. And I just thought I need to make this work, but what do I have to do to make it work? How does that happen? And so that led to me researching what um, became the book. I stumbled across this concept of place attachment, which is this emotional bond that we can develop with the places where we live. And that became this kind of goal for me that I wanted to become place attached in Blacksburg and I needed to figure out how that could happen. Yeah, I love this idea because we know that it exists. If you look at how people, you know, it's always root, root, root for the home team, right? And like how people get so attached to like their local football team or their, I mean, in Arkansas, for example, everyone's a Razorback fan and it doesn't really matter if you went to the University of Arkansas, but because there's no like professional teams there, everyone becomes an Arkansas Razorback fan just by living within the state lines of Arkansas. And I think it's really interesting how people, you know, they do develop this, you know, you cheer for your home team, but when you're a transplant to that city, you know, people to move to Arkansas and they're like, what in the heck is a Razorback? You know, <laughs> Like, and why am I going to learn to call the hogs? And I don't want to do pig suey, you know, like it's not their thing. They're don't looking at you like they're a the nut. Hogs. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, it's interesting because sports is a really good parallel for that feeling of place attachment. You know, you have like Dorothy Gale and there's no place like home. And about a third of Americans still live in the town where they grew up, which to me is sort of mind blowing, you know, as someone who's moved around a lot. Um, to, to have lived your entire life in the same place seems a little um, crazy, but that's how dedicated people are sometimes to the places where they're from. That's where their family is. That's what they know. And it gives us a real sense of, you know, community and also a sense of identity. Um, there's a, a part of place attachment called place identity. That is, you start to you know, consider yourself of this place, this place that you're from tells everyone what you're like, what's important to you, who you are. It allows you to do the things that you care most about. And so, you know, even though I think as Americans, we've become kind of mobile and restless about 12% of Americans move every year. Um, I think we all crave that sense of rootedness, that sense of place and belonging. And so when you're in a position in your life or just a time in your life where you're moving a lot, um, you can really miss that. Um, and maybe without even knowing that you're missing it, you simply feel a little um, out of place in, in the places that you land. Right. And one of the things I like that you pointed out was there's different things like you can feel mobile and that's more of like someone that just maybe likes adventure and they want to to do that and you can feel stuck in a place and then you can feel rooted in a place. And so can you talk to us a little bit about the differences between mobile, stuck, and rooted? Yeah, this idea comes from Richard Florida, who's a sociologist and he writes a lot about um, places and moving and things like that. And he says that when you are mobile, um, that's often related to, you know, being in a certain period in your life. Young people tend to be more mobile than older people. You're moving around for jobs and family and things like that. And you're not really connected or loyal to any one particular community. So if a new job opportunity pops up 2,000 miles away, you'll take it, you know, no big deal. People who are stuck are people who may or may not have been in their community for a long time, but just don't really like it. <laughs> um, they don't love where they are, but they don't feel like they have the resources to move on. Maybe they feel trapped because of a work situation or, you know, I need to be here for my family or something like that. They just feel a little unhappy where they are. So people who are rooted, on the other hand, are people who, again, may or may not have been in their community for a terribly long time, but it feels like a choice. They want to be there. They're happy there. They're, they feel part of the community and 
Um, they don't want to move. I think a lot of us kind of in the back of our mind are always thinking about the next move. Where can I go next? <laughs> this town isn't perfect for me. What's next? Or we go on vacation and we think, what would it be like if I lived here? I used to have a habit anytime I travel. Okay. I'll admit it, I still do this, <laughs> <clears throat> you know, pick up those little real estate guides and just fantasize about your other life. You know, what would life be like if I live in this town? And people who are rooted, um, you know, we may still do that, but we tend to do it a little less because, you know, we can't imagine that life would be better in the next town. Life is good right now as it is. And that sense of rootedness or place attachment um, has a lot of extraneous benefits. Um, it gives us a deeper sense of well-being. It makes us healthier in general. There's research that shows it helps us live longer. And so it's something that's, you know, not just necessarily a, a bonus when you get it, but, you know, something not to think about. It's, it's worth working for because it does give us so much positive affect in our lives. Yeah, I find this idea super fascinating, but also a little bit difficult. I'm thinking about, okay, so, you know, my show, Married to Doctors, I talk to a lot of physician families. And as part of that, we go through the match system. And many, many couples can feel stuck, I think, especially for the spouse. So the physician, you know, they get a match, they're they're continuing in their education. Good for them, you know, and as the loved one, we're very happy for them. And yet sometimes that puts us moving to a place we don't want to move to. Like we know we don't want to move there because it wasn't number one on our list, but that's where we're moving. And it often means giving up a job, moving further from family. And so for those listening in my audience that are in that place right now where they do feel kind of just stuck, like I'm stuck here for the next three years, I'm stuck here for the next five or six years. How can they go from that feeling of stuck to maybe feeling more rooted or better embracing a community where they really don't feel the connection? I think the first thing to recognize is that you are not alone, <laughs> that a lot of people go through this situation. I've talked to a lot of military families who you know, have to do this every couple of years and just get sent somewhere and you don't know how long you're staying. And I, you know, that sense of sort of being out of control of your destination and, and therefore your destiny can be really difficult. It feels like you're in an arranged marriage. You know, we want to choose who we, who we date and who we marry and who we end up with. And in this particular situation, it's just sort of handed to you. Like maybe at the beginning you said, that sounds okay. I guess I'll move to Columbus, Ohio, you know, if I have to. And, and then match day happens and all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, I, I didn't actually want to go there. It feels a little bit like you're losing control of your life and that can be really difficult. So for people who are in those places where you didn't think you'd end up and you wouldn't have chosen necessarily for yourself, I think um, an important thing to remember is that you can reassert some control of your life because place attachment is something that we can create for ourselves. It doesn't just happen magically. It is based on our taking purposeful, meaningful action where we live. So, you know, this is not love at first sight. This is something that develops over time, a sense of, of connection and a sense of community and a sense of love where we are. So when I landed in Blacksburg and knew right away that it was not my favorite town and, you know, started plotting, how can I get out of here? And realized I couldn't, you know, my husband had a job here. We needed to stay for the time being. I realized that the approach I wanted to take was to try and consciously, on purpose, change my feelings about my town. There was all this research that showed that certain behaviors connected to place attachment, you know, whether, you know, these were things that people did who were place attached or they, they created it. And so I created for myself what I call love where you live experiments. These were sort of habit change and behavior change ideas things I could do that would make me feel better about my town. And they were all relatively simple, easy, inexpensive things, but things that would 
change my mind about Blacksburg. So, you know, one of the first things I did was walk. There's a lot of research that shows that walking can make us feel more connected to our communities because it makes us aware of our surroundings. When you're in a car, you're just kind of blowing past things. Walking uh, slows you down to this really human pace and it makes you notice what's around you, you know, the, the tree and the dog and the neighbor out working in their garden. And so I started taking walks in my neighborhood. And um, just that one thing helped me feel just a little bit more at home in my town. You know, maybe not a ton, but just a little. It kind of opened that door a little. And so then I went on to um, come up with um, a few more Love Where You Live experiments. The book, uh, This Is Where You Belong, details all of them. There are 10 kind of broad categories from walking to volunteering to exploring nature. And for each of these, I would do two or three things that would help me feel more at home in my hometown. And, you know, the spoiler alert is that it actually worked. Um, and I spent about a year on this, so it didn't happen immediately. But toward the end of this, you know, period of doing Love Where You Live experience pretty intensively, I would have these experiences where I'd be, you know, out like riding my bike in my town. I'd just kind of be like, I love it here, you know, which was not a thought that I had at the beginning when I first moved there. And so I think if you're feeling stuck in your place, understanding that you can change that feeling, you can become rooted if you want to, well, you know, I hope that gives you a sense of, of hope, of purpose, you know, that this is not just a situation that you're stuck in against your will. You can change it for yourself. Yeah. And I think that's great advice to just get out kind of among the locals walking or biking or finding something that you can volunteer to do to get connected. Um, probably finding like a church or a synagogue or, you know, finding people that you connect with. I mean, because if you have friends, I think you're going to feel more connected to the city itself. Um, learning the local history, I don't know, is that something that you recommend? Yeah, absolutely. One of the Love Where You Live experiments I did here is go to the local historic plantation, which was so not anything I would have done if I wasn't like trying so hard to do these experiments. But um, absolutely, getting a, a feel for the history of your town, what it, you know, what, it, what it's been through as a community makes you feel more connected to it. You know, part of this is feeling a sense of ownership for your place. People who are truly place attached want to be involved where they live. They want to know what's going on. Um, and, you know, we can sort of take that bull by the horns by, you know, finding out about events and attending them. One thing that I always recommend is make a bucket list for your town and maybe not just your town, but the area around you. I've talked to a lot of people who are moving and, you know, they get to the end of their two or three years in this town and realize, oh yeah, we've never done that thing that everyone said we should do. So when you're new in a place or maybe just trying to change your feelings about a place, create a bucket list, start asking the waiters that, you know, serve you in restaurants or friends, people at church, um, what do they recommend doing around here? What do people absolutely love around here? And commit to doing those things, changing your feelings about this place slowly over time. Yeah, I think those are some excellent suggestions. When we were in Wisconsin, I had the opportunity to go out and actually see like a um, maple tree farm and they were like tapping the maple syrup and boiling it down. And all of that was just so foreign to me and so cool. I couldn't get over it. I'm like, what the sap is coming out of the tree? You know, and I, I know I just like was putting my foot in my mouth sounding like an idiot, but it was so cool to me to just see this whole different thing that happened, you know, and how you, how you make maple syrup and, and seeing it live there. It was super cool. I wanted to ask you this though. So in all these efforts to get rooted someplace, is that, is it worth the effort if you know you're only going to be somewhere like three to five years? So a lot of residents, you know, we know it's kind of short term there. We may know going into it, there probably won't be a job job there when we finish residency or we may just know going into it, hey, we want to move back closer to family 
or we don't want to live in the north, it's too cold, or whatever personal reason. So we may know ahead of time we're going to be leaving. I feel like it's kind of a disadvantage if you know ahead of time you're going to go, because then it's like almost like you don't maybe want to get attached. Oh, and I would say this too. This always sucks. I know when we've moved, sometimes someone will meet me and inevitably they'll find out that we're temporary and then they'll back off from the friendship. So it's like, they're so excited to meet me and they think we can connect. We have kids similar in age or whatever the connection is. And then as soon as they find out, we might leave in a few years. Like I, I've had people tell me this and I know I'm not, you know, not alone, but it's like, oh, well, you know, I don't want to get to know you too well because I know you're going to be gone or I don't want to, you know, like you too much because you're going to be leaving. And I'm just like, oh, okay, well, I guess I didn't need a friend for the next two or three years, you know? So how, yeah. how should we respond to that? What should we do? So that's the worst. And I've totally seen that um, because, you know, my husband's an academic. So we live in university towns and they're very transient and I've heard people say those exact words, you know, how long are you going to be here is the first question that people ask when they meet someone new. And if the answer is, oh, you know, we're just in grad school, we're only going to be here for a couple of years, it, you can like see, you know, the other person sort of shut down. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to get to know you because, you know, I think part of it is you know, it's work to invest in relationships. It takes, you know, it takes time, it takes energy and people feel like there's not going to be a big payoff for me because, you know, I'm going to invest all this time and energy in developing a relationship and you're going to leave and, I, you know, I'm going to lose that investment. But I also think people are sort of afraid of being hurt. You know, it's like, falling in love with someone with a terminal illness or something like, you know, it has an end point and people just don't, don't want that, um, to have to deal with that sadness of losing a friend. So the problem is you can't really control other people's, you know, other people's responses to that situation as much as you want to, you know, punch them in the mouth or something like that for being ridiculous about it. But you can control your approach to this situation. You know, I think there's, I completely understand that urge to say, I'm only here for three years. Why should I bother? I'm just going to lock myself in my house and, you know, read books or whatever. Um, but think about that. Three years of your life is a really long time. It's a really long time to sacrifice connection. It's a really long time to be lonely. It's a long time to be miserable and, and disconnected with your community. So I, you know, when we were in grad school, you know, my husband was in grad school uh, in Iowa and someone moved to our town who was doing um, sort of a fellowship year. They knew from the beginning they would only be there for one year. And certainly no one would have blamed them if they just hold up and, you know, never really talked to anyone. Um, but instead, they took the exact opposite approach. They, you know, attended every event in the community they could. They became really active in, you know, church and social groups. They invited people over for dinner. They really went to an enormous effort to reach out and connect with people. And so when they moved a year later, people were so sorry to see them go because they'd really had an impact on on their town and on the people around them in just one year. So I take that as my example for how we should act in communities where we know we might live short term. You know, you may not be there for very long, but the friends you make, thanks to social media, can be your friends forever. Um, you don't have to completely lose contact with them. Um, and you will have a network of connections all over the country that you're leaving behind. Um, and they will make that one year or two years or three years so much more enjoyable and fulfilling. So to me, it's worth it, even though you know that, you know, you are investing in a way that, you know, you might not recoup that investment emotionally. Um, it's worth it. It's worth pushing past those walls of resistance you encounter. And it's worth spending your time trying to love a place that you know you'll leave. 
you know, there are no guarantees in life. And, you know, for even those of us who think that we'll be in a place for a long time, we, we may be surprised to find out um, we're not. I have a friend in town in Blacksburg who moved here. They immediately bought a house. You know, her husband had a job here and they thought they were going to be here forever. And so they poured themselves into being here and making friends and hosting social events. And then her husband lost his job and, you know, three years in, they're moving away. If they had known that from the beginning, they probably would have approached Blacksburg differently. But thank goodness they didn't know that. And so they approached it like people who would be here forever. And I think that's a good rule of thumb for all of us. Yeah. And I love that you brought up social media because it does give us the ability to stay in touch with people. But on the same turn, it can make us well, it can make it really easy to isolate too. So you move to a new place and instead of getting out and meeting actual like in the flesh humans, you're just interacting with friends on social. And I feel like then, gosh, it's so hard because you're kind of either living in the past with the other friends or you're living in the future. Like when we get back, you know, it's like you're making plans or thinking about your past plans. And at least for me, that never felt completely healthy or good. I always feel like it could be too, too because I'm a bit of a people person. Not everyone is, but I feel like there's something really valuable in just knowing your neighbor next door. Is that really old fashioned? Am I kooky for thinking that I should meet my neighbors? I just know when we moved here to Albuquerque and we're just here for a one year fellowship. So again, it's one of those situations. It's very easy not to connect with people, but my neighborhood had the coolest little Halloween party at the end of our street. They invited everyone on the street. It was so great for us to go and meet the neighbors. And then on Christmas Eve, they did another really cool thing that they do every year for Christmas Eve. They have this big bonfire and they light up the street with luminarias. And I was like, this is, we picked the perfect street to live on because they reached out to us. And I know that hasn't been the case everywhere. So I guess a couple of questions like, is it important to have, you know, human connection with the neighbors? And then if it is, how do we meet the neighbors without being like complete weirdos or like looking <laughs> like, I don't know, like we're from 1950 wearing an apron and delivering cupcakes, you know, like I don't want to be like super cheesy about it either. So like, what's the balance there? So <laughs> the answer to your first question is, um, yes, it's important to know your neighbors. And also, yes, it's super old fashioned. <laughs> um, you know, back in the forties and fifties, People socialized with their neighbors. That's what they did. You'd have, you know, your bunko group or your poker night with your neighbors. About 50% of Americans socialize at least once a week with neighbors, which is um, kind of crazy to contemplate because nowadays most of us struggle even to know the names of our neighbors. And um, I feel a little hypocritical talking about this because I'm, I'm sort of naturally bad at it. You know, I'm an introvert and um, I'm very good at waving at people and also very good at forgetting people's names, um, things like that. So there's a lot of good reasons to kind of force yourself out of your comfort zone here. There are, um, there's a study from University of Michigan that found that people are 67% less likely to have a stroke and 48% less likely to have a heart attack when they have trusting relationships with their neighbors. So, you know, know their name, willing to talk to them once in a while. And, and that's not even saying that you're BFFs, just that you kind of have a certain level of trust. There was another study that found that when people feel a sense of cohesion in their neighborhood, like they feel like people know each other and at least marginally like each other, uh, that they reported fewer um, negative physical symptoms overall. So people feel better when they know and like their neighbors. So then the question becomes, how do you actually do that? Uh, one of my love where you live experiments totally took the cheesy 1950s route on this. You know, we baked banana muffins and we took them around to our neighbors. Um, there's actually a holiday in September called Good Neighbor Day. I think it's September 28th. And we, you know, took these paper points of muffins around and said, happy Good Neighbor Day. And people went, who are you? 
crazy people. Um, but the upside of it was that, you know, I don't think anyone was turned off by it or thought we were beyond so weird that they absolutely you know, didn't want anything to do with us. And in fact, one neighbor across the street who was this guy, you know, probably 15 years younger than us, he has these big dreadlocks and ear gauges and, you know, we're like sort of these just white bread middle American people. And, you know, we were a little nervous to take this guy banana muffins and thought, what is his response going to be? And he was <laughs> over the moon about it, like could not believe that we had done this and just, you know, over and over again, this is so cool. Um, and it turned out that in a neighborhood with a lot of rentals, he had been in that house for a long time. He could tell us all about the history of the house where we were living and knew everyone in the neighborhood. And that one interaction turned out to be this really positive connection. We've also done things like invite people over for dinner. We had a dessert night where we invited four neighborhood families and encouraged everyone to bring a dessert to share. And that turned out to be great, not only for us, but for our neighbors who connected with each other. You know, we had a couple neighbors who both had babies and they started hanging out and babysitting each other's kids. So I think on a very basic level, you know, maybe you don't start with the banana muffins. Maybe you want to start a little small, smaller. So you wave and then you move up to saying hi, you ask their name and you write it down so you don't forget it and have that awkward situation where you're like, I'm supposed to know your name and I don't. Um, there's also a lot of, you know, speaking of social media, there's a lot of online ways now to connect with neighbors. There's um, a website called nextdoor.com, which is sort of like a Facebook for neighborhoods. And I, I've heard of, from a lot of people who really love that as a way to, you know, have positive, um, but not super intense interactions with neighbors, just kind of like, uh, hey, I'm selling a bookcase or, you know, does anyone want tickets to the high school play, that kind of thing. Um, uh, there's a woman in Austin who I, I'm a big fan of who wrote a book called The Turquoise Table. She was hosting a dinner party and had needed a little extra seating. So she ordered a, you know, a wooden picnic table from Lowe's. And when the people delivered it, they dropped it in her front yard and she just kept it there. And they made a point as a family to, you know, eat dinner in the front yard at the table or do homework at the table in the front yard. And pretty soon that table became a gathering place for neighbors. You know, people who were out on runs would sort of stop and chat briefly or say hi, or people would make it the meeting spot if they wanted to, you know, go on a walk or go do something. So I think, um, you know, there are so many great ideas for connecting with neighbors and you sort of find the thing that works for you and your level of social, um, you know, introversion or extroversion and, um, you know, but it's worth making the effort to connect with the people right around us. Social media is great. It's awesome to be able to talk to the people in the old towns where you've lived, but I agree it can kind of be, um, it can kind of create the illusion that we have more human interaction than we actually do. Um, interacting with people who are, you know, in our neighborhoods, in our communities that we can talk to in person is qualitatively different than talking to people on Facebook. Well, our time is running short. Do you have any other tips, tricks to being happy where we live? I think just find your tribe in, in your new town. Um, all my research about place attachment all seem to lead back to the same general idea, which is that when we know people in our community, when we have relationships of trust, relationships that are positive in our town, we're so much happier where we are. Um, and that's hard. I'm, I'm really introverted and, um, you know, going outside of that little cone of protection to actually talk to humans can be difficult. Um, but it's worth making the effort because it makes us so much happier, so much more content where we are. I found in researching places and place attachment that the difference between just a random spot um, and a place that you love is meaning. And we ascribe meaning to places when we have 
positive experiences there and positive relationships. So doing the things that make you happy in your new community that maybe you don't feel so great about will slowly change your feelings over time. It will make that place more meaningful. And it may not ever be the world's greatest fit for you. Maybe you're, you know, a city person and you ended up in a small town or vice versa. Not every town is going to be the best place for you, but you can, I think, make it the best place for you right now if you want to. And I think it's worth the effort. All right. That sounds like some some great words of wisdom and I hope everyone can apply these things. And I agree that it's worth the effort, even if it's a little awkward at times to just put yourself out there, find something to volunteer at. It's always hard to be like, go to something where you don't know someone. And oftentimes too, as a physician spouse, you might be going alone, might be more comfortable if you could go with your partner, right? Mm -hmm. But then if you're going and then going alone, but you know, finding a hobby or something, I don't know, getting involved either through volunteer work or, you know, I don't know, volunteer at the local community theater or, um, do some music with someone or find a church you can volunteer something to do there. I think it makes a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. For me, you know, it's a book club. If I can find a book club in my new town, I'm okay. You know, of just a small circle of friends, you know, and for most of us, that's the way it is. You don't need to know everyone. You just need to know one or two people and that kind of makes everything better. All right. Well, it's been a great pleasure having you on the show. Thanks again for your time today. Thanks so much for having me. I loved it. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Married to Doctors podcast. Our mission is to make successful homes happier. To learn more or to share your story, visit our website at marriedtodoctors.com.